Can you hear me now? Is that on? All right. Uh, we're going to uh, take a look at uh, Zechariah today. There's an, a, uh, an outline over by the door, and uh, we're going to go through that quickly. And the reason that we're going to go through it quickly is because this is one of, in this uh, series that you have been going through, on the Minor Prophets, Zechariah is the second to the last book, and it is, all the, it is also, I think, one of the longest. There's 14 chapters, so in the time that we have this morning, we're not getting through 14 chapters. But I went ahead and outlined it for you. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, when you're looking at these prophecies, we need to understand what prophecy is. We tend to think of prophecy as being predictions of the future. That's a small part of it. Prophets were called to deliver a message from God to the people of Israel or Judah alive at that time for them. So a great deal of the prophetic literature has nothing to do with the future. It has to do with the historical past. For example, a great deal of Isaiah, a great deal of Jeremiah, had to do with the 8th and 6th centuries, not with some long, long future. That's true of Jeremiah. Jer the, the majority of Jeremiah has a message for the people who've returned from Babylon, and it's about their immediate future. Now, we can learn a lot from that, and, uh, and the themes that we're going to go over are eternal. The last part of the book, however, is what we think about of prophecy, which has to do with things that are about 500 years in the future. So in Jeremiah, we have both. We also have a discussion of God's will. And when discussing God's will, we have to break it into at least two parts. The first part is God's causative or determined, determinative will, which means God causes it to happen. God decrees it, and history moves in a trajectory that makes it happen. The other part of God's will is God's permissive will, which is that you and I, societies, nations, are permitted to do things God doesn't like. Right. So not everything in history is caused by God or directed by God because God allows along the way us to screw things up. Right. And we're going to get both of these, a discussion of both of these in Zechariah. And we're going to start with a, uh, a, a brief survey that says, look, y'all talked about Haggai, I think, last week who prophesied around the year 520 in the second year of Darius the Mede, Medo-Persian. If you'll take a look at verse 1 in Zechariah, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. It's exactly the same period. So they are, they are prophesying in the same years and this, these prophecies go for several years in Zechariah. And so the first part of this book uh, is going to be about the same issues that Haggai was talking about. And so we're going to uh, just briefly review those, and it's this. Cyrus allows the Jews to come back. And the story is told in Ezra and Nehemiah. The, uh, the idea that most Christians have is that the Jews were just thrilled to death, those from Judah, got on their camels and donkeys and went back. Well, of the myriads of people uh, who were the thousands upon thousands who were deported to Babylon, 43,000 came back. That's it. All right. And they come back to a land that is not empty. You know, 
Hundreds of thousands of people were killed by the Babylonians. Others sold into slavery. Others taken into, uh, into exile. Well, what happens when you've got an area that is really nice to live in, good agriculture, and depopulated? People move in. So when, they, when these people come back, it's not to an uninhabited land. The poor people were left. They weren't worth selling into slavery or, uh, or, or deporting, right? And so they have intermarried. It's been 70 years. They've settled down. Everybody's fat and happy, right? And they don't like these people coming back. And so if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, there's a constant conflict and danger to the people who come back. So the first thing they do is rebuild the walls of Jerusalem for safety. Right. The temple could wait, but we, you know, we're surrounded by people who are actively hostile to us. Right. And so that's the setting for this for Zechariah. God has a message for them about what I want you to do now, how I'm going to deal with you, and for the long foreseeable future, there's also some very difficult stuff in there for them to hear. So in this outline, what you have here is uh, an introduction, which is six verses we're going to go over, and then there are eight visions, and I'm not going to go through them all here, I'm just going to list them, and we'll take up little bits of these, but we don't have time to go through these, all these in depth. And then there's a question about feasts or fasts, which is a, uh, a very important question. We're going to talk about that because it, it has meaning for us today. And the last, I call it the coming king and the submission of the nations, chapters 9 through 14, is about the coming of Jesus, and the coming of Jesus the second time at the end of the ages. So this is where we talk about the long arc of prophecy here. Those chapters are about that. So let's just get into this quickly. We don't have a lot of time, but any time you have a question, please ask. So when this prophecy he begins in, this, uh, in the second year of Darius, he says this. And I'm going to read this. He says, The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. Uh, I'm going to skip down to verse 5. Where are your ancestors now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your ancestors? Then they repented, said the Lord Almighty. And anyway, so this is an important point that goes through this entire book. The word return in, uh, in verse 3 and following is the Hebrew word shuv. And that's important because S-H-U-V means to return, right? And in, you drop down to verse uh, 6, then they repented shuv. And God says, if you return, shuv, I will return. Shuv. Shuv is translated return and repentance. In one of the most famous passages, it's Isaiah. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. It's Isaiah 30 and verse 15. Again, the word is shuv. And why am I making such a big deal of this? In the Old Testament, and I believe particularly in Matthew, the word repent, the underlying Aramaic in Matthew is the Aramaic for this tuv. It means to return to a covenant relationship with God. We think of repentance as good Baptists. If I get down on my knees and say, 
Jesus, come into my heart. I'm so sorry for my sin. That is not what repentance means in the Old Testament. Repentance means, yeah, you should be sorry for what you did, but that's not good enough. You have to do something about, you have to make a concerted effort to return to covenant faithfulness. So what God is saying here, he goes on to say, where were your ancestors? Where are they now? They were not covenant faithful, and I sent them away for 70 years, the ones I didn't kill. And he says, why? You broke the covenant, so I don't have to live by my part of it, but if you'll come back, return, shuv, right? I will return to the covenant also. But for all these 70 years, that covenant hasn't existed because it takes two and it was broken. So the point of this whole book, now this is, remember the introduction, is how are we going to do that, or how do you do that? How do you come back into right relationship with Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, so that he will be your God, and we will reinstate temple worship, and I will promise to be what? your protector, your benefactor, I'll send you rain in the rainy seasons, you'll get crops, and I won't let anybody hurt you. But if you don't return to covenant, I don't care about your individuals, yeah, you can come back, but if you don't as a nation come back, then we're going to go through this all over again. You'll see that at the end of the book. So there, there follows a series of uh, 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 <clears throat> visions here brings us to the next point of this book. The one is God requires faithfulness on our part. The second is God is in charge of the long arc of history of the world, even though you can't see it. When you're in the midst of what's going on, and you're saying, what in the world is God doing? Where is God? God is saying to you, you know what? I got this. Whether you see it or not, whether you see me in the events of the world or not, I, I got it, right? And you may not see it your whole life long, and it's only as these people are, three generations later, looking back on it, and they say, oh my goodness, look where we are, and all that is because God was in charge, right? So it is, it is don't get, you know, uh, hysterical over what you're seeing and what you're facing here. And we're talking nationally here, right? Just trust that God's in charge and he's going to make it work. And that's what this next vision is about. It's about the man in the myrtle trees. It begins, uh, it, it's, we're still in chapter 1, begins in verse 7. And uh, Zechariah is visited by an angel he has a vision, and he looks out, and there's a man standing amid the myrtle trees on a red horse. And, and by this is, this is true for this. It's also true for uh, Revelation. It's not a red horse, as in like a fire engine, right? The underlying there means a roan or chestnut horse. It's a reddish. If anybody's been around horses or, or white-faced cattle, you know what the color is. It's not, it's not bright red. All right. And so Jeremiah looks, and there's three other horses behind him, a red, a brown, and a white. Well, that's a chestnut uh, and a bay and a white, okay, in Hebrew. And so he says, who, who are these? And so... The angel says to him, these are the ones the Lord sends throughout the earth. Now, we're talking 520 here. You know, we're not talking about flying around here. They're on horses, right? That's why the horse imagery is here. The idea is that God is fully aware of everything that's going on in the earth. He has, if you will, Eyes in the sky on everything. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's what these are doing. They're checking out what's happening in the world. 
And you notice they go here, if you read it, they go to the north, they go to the east, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, they go to the east, I'm sorry, I've confused myself here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's later on we get to chariot. But only three of them go out because one of them is where he needs to be, which is where? In Jerusalem. All right. Well, what do they find? What they find is, after having gone out throughout the whole world, they find the whole world is at rest and in peace. And you would say, well, that's a good thing, right? But you skip down to verse 15. It says, and I am very angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but they went too far with punishment. Being at peace here is not a good thing. What he's saying is the world is smugly going about its own way, not paying any attention to God, and that's a bad thing because I'm preparing to unleash, pardon me, holy hell on the world. The people that persecuted you, Babylonia, Persian, what's left of Assyria, the nations surrounding him, you think you are you know, untouchable. But you have no idea what's coming your way. And the reason is given, he said, you know what? I was a little angry with Judah. And I used you to punish them, but you went too far. It's this permissive versus causative will. Yes, I caused them to come but not to the extent that you did it. And so when I bring them back, I am going to, at that point, make sure you pay for it. And they do. Within, you know, 100 years or so. So in the next, the man with the measuring line, uh, it's on your outline, he goes and he measures Jerusalem. And he's told to stop. And it's in chapter 2 and verse uh, I think 4. Run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it, and I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord. So what's this about a wall? What's the first thing they built? The wall. What haven't they built? The temple. He's saying, you don't need to build the wall first. If you build the temple, and if you trusted me, you wouldn't need the wall. But you are trusting in yourself, your soldiers, etc., and still haven't really come back to me. So this, this obscure little passage is important because what he's saying is, you know what? You've got to build the temple first. Covenant relationship, and I'll take care of you. Don't rely on yourselves before you rely on me. And that's been true in every age when people, in fact, uh, think they're invulnerable. All the planes and nuclear weapons in the world won't help you in the midst of a terrible holocaust if God isn't with you. Now, do, you, do they need a wall? Yes, they do. He's not saying they don't. Do they need an army? Yes, they do. What he's saying is they're relying first foremost on that and not on him. So when you come back, remember, I brought you, and I'll take care of you. But you need to take care of first things first, which is your relationship with me. Yeah. So the next section is about, uh, oh, I, I want to say something. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, in number D, ordination of Joshua uh, and the sanctification of the altar. What's happened here is that the temple's been destroyed. And if you've read the previous prophets, it was destroyed because God was not only unhappy with the worship, he was disgusted with it. 
He said, you know, you are worshiping me with rituals and with your lips, and, uh, but you are, in fact, so far from me, I am going to make sure you don't sacrifice anything and that hey, the temple is destroyed, right? Now they're going to rebuild it. But with all of the criticisms of the priesthood, what he is doing here in this section is saying that uh, Joshua uh, ben Jehozadak is going to be my new high priest. He's a, going to be a descendant of, of, uh, of Aaron. He's reestablishing the priesthood. And all this long section is the fact that when he puts on clean clothes, etc., he says, I'm going to, to have to purify everything, and you all have to start again all over again. Right. And you will start with him. It's, it's, uh, it's Zedekiah's, or Zechariah's way of saying, when we begin this, we're going to begin with God's approval because God chose the high priest, and if God chose the high priest, you better pay attention. He has every right to be there because he was chosen directly by God. He's the one God names to be the high priest. And then he's going to go on to say in these golden lampstands, he's going to say, and I'm in charge. You may not see it. You may not uh, understand what I'm doing. But the golden lampstands are, it's the lampstand that was in the temple, and there's uh, oh, uh, channels pouring oil continuously so that the lamps always burn. They don't have to be filled, right? It's a little obscure, but what it means is who's in charge? Oh. How is that made real in the world? The Holy Spirit. That oil is the Holy Spirit flowing into Jerusalem and flowing into not only the new temple, but the people. The Holy Spirit is guiding this. And no, you can't see it again, but, but believe that he is there. And the two olive trees are Zerubbabel okay, and uh, Jehozadak. What he's saying is, look, these are your leaders. I chose them. You follow them. So he said, this, is a, this part of the prophecy is about the people who were alive at that time. And he's saying, don't think that this is arbitrary or some people got together in the back room and chose these people. I did. And they're to be your leaders, and you better pay attention to what they have to say. And then he goes on to say, this is the word to Zerubbabel, who's and actually, the governor, he's treated like king, but not by my might, no, I'm sorry, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What he's saying here is what's going to happen and what happens in history is not because of you. Don't think, no matter how powerful you seem to think you are, how big you get, you are owe everything to me. I make it happen, not you. And he's going to go on to talk about, I'm going to get even with Persia, what's left of Babylon. And remember, early on, the horsemen go out and they come back, see, everybody's at peace, meaning they're smug, fat, happy, and satisfied. And God says, you know, I don't care how powerful they are, I'm going to destroy them. And he does. And he's saying, no matter how powerful you get, remember it's only because I let you. <laughs> and that's a lesson for the ages, by the way. The two lessons of this book that I think are very important for us today is that you can't see God's action in the world. God is watching. The horsemen are, is the idea of God is watching everything. God allows certain things to happen and causes other things to happen, but ultimately he's in charge, not us. And forgetting that is fatal. 
But there's something else that happens here. Uh, by the way, there's a little piece, and I'm not going to go over about the seven-eyed capstone. Uh, that's, again, about the Holy Spirit. So, but now, uh, when you get to chapter 5, there are two things that are Im important because they're important for us. They were important for them. There's something called the flying scroll, right? I see a flying scroll 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. What is that? Anybody can guess what that is? It's the law. It's judgment. What God is saying is the covenant law is, uh, and the scrolls of the law are what? They're the covenant between God and Israel. And he's bringing back the covenant. Right? The covenant is coming back to Jerusalem. It's coming back to the Jews. But it's carrying with it judgment on those who, what? Don't pay any attention to it. It's on, on both sides. And it's a message of both hope and judgment. When I bring you back, as I have, then I expect you to enter into covenant relationship with me. And for those who do, I will bless you. But if you don't, there's nothing but judgment. Yeah. I'm just saying, you know, all these prophets uh, have their own little thing going, mm -hmm. and, you know, and they're interpreting what God's saying and all this. You know, um, why don't we just, why don't they just use the Ten Commandments? I mean, <laughs> they're pretty good. They're from God. Let them just... Let it go. Well, actually, he is. I'm going to show you he is here. But the point is, if they were following the Ten Commandments, if they were following the Torah, there wouldn't be any need for the prophets to come and accuse them. They're not doing it. But there's something else that happens after this scroll, and this one I do want to talk about. It begins in verse 5. It's called The Woman in a Basket. Then the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said to me, look up and see what is happening. I asked, what is it? He replied, it is a basket, and, uh, I'm sorry, a basket, and in the basket sat a woman. There was a cover of lead that was raised. When he said, this is wickedness, and he pushed, the, uh, he pushed her back into the basket, think of her head's coming up like this, and he pushed back down, he puts the lead back on top of her, and pushed lead cover down on it. And then I'm going to skip down, he said, where are they taking the basket? He replied, to the country of Babylonia to build a house for it. When the house is ready, the basket will be sat there in its place. And the name, by the way, of the woman is wickedness. So what in the world is that all about? And is that important? What's critical? There was something called a daily sacrifice, called mincha. And the mincha was a cake of fine flour mixed with olive oil to which frankincense had been uh, added. So that it was put on the altar, it, it burned a pleasing odor to God. It was the morning sacrifice, right? Well, in Isaiah 66, uh, we're not going to go there and look at it, uh, Isaiah records that God says, the mincha is completely disgusting to me. Right? The priest might as well break a dog's neck. Dogs were considered unholy. And you might as well mix blood, pig's blood, with the, uh, the flour as incense. Well, there hadn't been a mincha in a long time. And God is getting ready to reinstitute temple worship, right? And the whole precinct and the whole people have to be purified. What's the woman? What's the lead? Well, what is translated basket, maybe somebody else has something else in theirs. It's an ephah. We don't know what an ephah was, by the way. It's a dry measurement, okay? That's all we know. But the mincha was a ephah of fine flour. So she's in the right amount, 
but there's wickedness here, and instead of a fine cake, it's a what? It's a cake of lead that sits on her. There's meaning here. In the pre-Babylonian captivity, the Jews were beginning to worship other gods in the temple precinct. And one of them is Ishtar. Ishtar was widely, uh, was a goddess of fertility. And she was widely worshipped in the regions and in Babylon. And they have come back, what? To Yahweh. They haven't left the worship of Ishtar in Babylon. And this is another important lesson. It's one of the lessons of Zechariah. What you said, the first commandment, first of the Ten Commandments is what? I am the Lord your God, a jealous God. You shall have no other gods before me. God is saying, I don't share. Right? And so in order for the, not just the temple worship, for the people to enter into covenant relationship with God again, they got to get rid of this stuff. Right. And what he's saying is, I am not going to tolerate it. I'm sending her back to Babylon where she belongs. They can make an altar for her and put her on it, but you won't have it here. So what does that have to do with us? What's it say to us today? How many Christians do you know who, who, people who claim to be Christians say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm also a Buddhist? How many Christians do you know who don't feel bad at all of, about engaging in sort of New Age rituals and so forth like that? A lot. Baptist, you know. And what's this phrase? You hear all the time, there are many paths to God. Zechariah is saying, don't even think about it. You are either a follower of Yahweh or not. You can't be a follower of Yahweh and a follower of some other god or religion. It's mutually exclusive. You're an either or, and that's it. And so uh, in the modern world, we're often told, well, well, I mean, the other Everybody is loved of God, and they're all going to heaven. And all religions are the same. And our religion says, no, they're not. They're not the same. They're vastly different. And you can't be both. Daniel? Yeah. Yes, I just, uh, I just want to um, add to what you just said, John. Uh, mm -hmm. It's absolutely true. We have words <laughs> now like eclectic or syncretistic. You know, just as you know, you're saying that um, we can take a little bit of this and that. Now, I don't know if you remember Pastor Mike uh, shared this with us when he went to uh, Africa for an evangelistic uh, meeting. And uh, they came, you know, this was, I think, Zambia. They came in numbers and they said, well, you know what? We're going to also, we have our little gods, but we're also going to get the god of this white man that is coming so that we can have all these gods, you know, that we, you know, and I think that's exactly what, you know, Zechariah is talking about. And I think this is a, a refrain throughout the prophetic literature that God is a jealous God. And, you know, if we are called to covenant loyalty, we cannot mm -hmm. share God with these gods of the Canaanites, you know, or, and all the other gods that are around there. And I think this is really specific instruction that God mm -hmm. is giving to us. And it's really important for us to heed it. Thank you, Daniel. He gave us specific instructions when he gave us the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's in Actually, there. yes, he did. But as a, you're right. But how many people in this world live the Ten Commandments? <laughs> Not many. <clears throat> and so the point is that uh, the first commandment, I'm, I'm a jealous God I don't share. And so... Uh, we're going to skip a little because uh, we're going to skip the chariots because they're very much like the horses and, and they're, again, the same. But uh, so after these oracles or, or these visions, uh, in the fourth year, two years later, after the beginning of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, the month of Kislev. Now, 
that's an important day because the Jews have been fasting and mourning because that's the day the temple was destroyed. The first temple was destroyed. Right. We're also going to find out that it, in you know some 550, 60 years from now, the second temple will be dis, uh, destroyed on guess what? The same day. <laughs> the same day. So the, it, while they were in uh, Babylon, the Jews, uh, to their credit, develop a, a intense Torah study in uh, the rise of the synagogues, and they mourn the loss of the temple. And so they establish fasting on that day. And so now that they're back in Jerusalem, they're going to build a temple again, they have a reasonable question to ask. And the reasonable question is, should we continue this tradition of fasting that we have been doing for 70 years? It's a reasonable question. Uh, so God asks a number of questions to them. And this is where it becomes uh, applicable to us again. And the word of the Lord came, Almighty came to me, ask the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month for the past 70 years, was it really for me you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking for your feast, were you not feasting for yourselves? Are these not the words the Lord proclaim through the earlier prophets? What, what is he saying there? Micah, the prophet Micah in 6.8, uh, before his famous, what does the Lord require of you but to what? Love God, do mercy, et cetera, et cetera. He condemns them for what? Empty religion. And what God is asking here, when you fasted, were you really fasting for the loss of the temple? Were you really fasting in hope that I would hear you? Or was this just a cultural empty ritual? And it is a good question. And, and he doesn't answer it, actually. And when you were feasting on your big feast days and had these big family events and everything was good, were you feasting because it was a feast to me, or did you just like the food and wine? You know, was it real or was it cultural? And then he says, in, <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor, and do not plot evil against one another. He's saying, you know, all your family, feasts, uh, that's fine. But only if you're what? Doing it for God, but in the midst of what? A moral life. He's saying, now I'm not just looking at you going to church on Sundays. Having communion once a quarter. I'm looking at how do you live your life? And what is you, in the midst of your heart? So, I was just going to say that's what uh, <laughs> you know these all these various religions uh, in the world, and uh, I just have a personal thing uh, because I was raised a Catholic, so you know I mm -hmm. had no other choice in the matter at that time because I was a little kid. But I, I guess I, when I got smart and I knew that I wanted Jesus to be my personal Savior. Mm -hmm. And my and the person I wanted to follow, um, it was a whole different feeling than what they still do in the Catholic Church. And and I, it's you know that's that's what bothers me is that I don't think I don't think a lot of them take him on as their personal mm -hmm. savior. They they go through I think like this ritual business you're talking about. That's mm -hmm. what made me think of it. I think a lot of it is just ritualistic stuff and uh, I think that's true but it, and it's true of other denominations but it's also true of Baptists 
I got to tell you, I've been in Baptist churches when there was no more spirit present in there. It was loud and fun and great praise music. There was no more spirit in, the, in there than there was, you know, in the Safeway down the street. And so I, I don't usually like to, you know, use others as example. I'd rather use us and say, no, I, I've been in, in Baptist churches where if God was present, he was, or Jesus, he was pretty hidden, you know. And all the right things were said, and all the right prayers were given, and like I said, and that is what he's talking about. It doesn't matter what denomination you are. It doesn't matter what particular church you go to. The question is, how is that community, and how are you worshiping and approaching this, regardless of, of organization? Then he's going to go on to say here, He's going to go on to say here, uh, this is what the Lord Almighty says, just as I had determined to bring disaster on you and showed no pity when your ancestors angered me, says Lord Almighty. So now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. But do not be afraid. These things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other. <clears throat> Render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other. Do not love to swear falsely. And I hate all this, declares the Lord. That's pretty stark. What he's saying is, okay, you're going to come back. I promise to help you, but don't forget, I am going to make demands on you. They're not that hard. <laughs> don't lie to each other. Don't cheat each other in business. Have your courts render good judgment and look after people who can't look after you himself. That's more important than the sacrifices that we are going to reestablish in the temple. We're going to move on. So because I do want to get now after chapter 9, I'm going to skip a good part of uh, 9, 10. So just read a few verses because we don't have time. But I want to read some verses that might be familiar to you. This is the, king, the coming of Zion's king is in chapter 9, verse 9. Easy to remember, 9-9. Nine, nine. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You remember that one? All right. The Lord's care uh, for Judah. It says, chapter 10, verse 8. I will signal for them and gather them. Surely I will redeem them. They will be as numerous as before, though I scatter them among the peoples, yet in distant lands they will remember me. They and their children will survive, and they will return. I will bring them back from Egypt to gather them from Assyria. Prior to this, he's saying, there's going to come another time when I scatter you all over the world. Yeah, you're coming back now, but there's going to come another time of judgment. I'm going to scatter you all over the world, but there's going to come a time when I bring you back from everywhere and reestablish you in Jerusalem. This is, for them, 2,500 years or so, or uh, 2,000 years in the future. And he's going to talk about the enemies being destroyed. Uh, his enemies, the spiritual forces beginning on, uh, in chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieves bitterly for him as one grieves, grieves for a firstborn son. So who's that? That's Jesus and the crucifixion, right? And Jesus goes on to say, uh, let's see. They will, as Zacharias, they will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And I will turn my hand against the little ones. That is directly quoted in Matthew 24 and verse 31. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. The third I will put into the fire. I will refine them and like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say they are my people. 
and the Lord is our God. Again, this is a, a coming what? Judgment on, on Israel, but not permanently. There'll be a remnant. And this is the, the 14th chapter, uh, and then we'll have to quit, but there'll be time for questions. 14.1, the day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations who did this to you as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountains moving north and half moving south. And you will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel, which is the great desert. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah. Then the Lord will come with all of his holy ones with him. On that day, neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness, it will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it to the east, to the Dead Sea, and half of it to the west, to the Mediterranean Sea, in summer and winter. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be only one Lord and his name, the only name. But I want to go back to verse 7. It is a unique day, a day known only to the Lord with no distinction, etc. cetera. Uh, Matthew 24 and 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows but the Father, not even the Son. That's a quote from Zechariah, this verse right here. Then he goes on to say, the very last verses, On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, the cooking pots, and the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the author, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is a prediction of the final judgment on the earth and the coming of Jesus. The first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. So that is where when we get into, I talk to you about prophecy is often not about distant future. It's about messages for people right then and there. Most of this book is about prophecy for people right there living in Jerusalem, those who returned in 520. But the end of this book is about the far, far future, God's ultimate judgment and the renewal of all things. Any questions? And those, by the way, are very famous passages in the New Testament. John, thank you. I just want to say, and I think you made a point. You know, you notice in the book of Zechariah, there are a whole host of uh, allusions uh, mm. from the New Testament, right. uh, which they quote. And I think this is really kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And the point you made is also kind of uh, something we all need to think about, that the prophecies were made for that time, but at the same time, you know, those who came later on saw, ah, maybe these prophecies could also...